gentlemen, we are back here for our problem solved panel. We're going to dive straight into it because we are running a little bit behind and we'll introduce ourselves from our left to your right. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jonathan Davis, I run a web agency called Lined Up, um, based in St Agnes, Will Kitty. Um, we've been focusing on e-commerce for the last three years, predominantly using the Shopify platform, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that platform. Um, we the first quality agency to acquire Shopify expert status, which meant we got a level of accreditation from Shopify and we could do what we're doing to a good standard. Um, and yeah, we just work on that platform and deliver e-commerce websites and e-post systems for our clients. Wonderful, uh, You've already heard from me this morning, but just a few minutes ago, it's probably very cool to coding digital. Hi everybody, my name is Rob Sanders. I'm one of the founders of Class Data. Um, we are an agri-tech company based in Penryn. And we focus uh, predominantly on getting different, very different data sets together to talk to each other. Um, and linking up <coughs> different bits of hardware, for example, IT devices. Um, so it all sort of flows into one place and is easily analyzable. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dave Walker, I'm a fan company from Power Order, uh, a mobile water sports tracking app, uh, looking at kind of quality of self, being healthy, how far you've gone, uh, and also water sports safety as well. And I won't introduce myself because you all have for me ready to say. So, this session is primarily designed for you to give us your questions. Um, no pressure on those of you who are here, uh, but the crowd has thin slightly, so I expect lots of interesting questions from you around the topic of um, problems solved. Now it's important before we dive into this that we actually define what a problem is in this context. Um, is a problem as simple as a bottleneck, or is it something more? Who would like to start with that one? It can be. Um, <laughs> 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 um, the, I mean, a bottleneck is kind of like a can be caused by a whole load of different things. Um, so yes, absolutely. It can, Um, so I, I had time to describe a problem as an outcome, so an outcome to be fixed, or what you want to see change, or and I think uh, Rob's right that, that a bottleneck could be a point of friction that determines what that problem is, um, but there could be a whole host of different reasons why that exists. It might not be the direct problem, it might not be the root cause. Um, so understanding what you're trying to achieve and understanding what you want to see is very important in some ways. <laughs> Um, for, for us, we as an agency, we're experiencing a lot of problem transfers with problems, maybe with some other agency, or maybe their business model, and they're trying to solve it. And we were constantly trying to solve those problems, so we wouldn't always necessarily succeed. So when we decided to go down a platform route, which is specialised in platform, that solved all those problems for us, it was just great. I mean, the classic problem used to say, you know, my payment gateway isn't accepting this credit card, for example, and I'd be like, bearing through lines and lines of code. Whereas now we just go, well, there's 400 brilliant software developers in San Francisco or somewhere developing this, I'm sure it's going to be fine, it's probably not a problem and it's usually get solved. So we just allocated resources remotely to some other great agencies to do, do it for us, so that's our solution. If it's as that, um, <laughs> I said, I suppose it's how you kind of view a problem, we look at problems, I suppose. We enable people to find solutions to their own problems surrounding power sports and what is very much within our kind of niche sector. Um, and we've got a platform kind of around that and we've got people within our technology a limited interaction from people reduces any potential problems that may arise. Which makes just one interesting point. There's a scale of what a problem can be and what's perceived to be by a user. I suppose you'll highlight that the problem to the team internally is likely to be a lot different to the problem from the end user. Is that right? Okay. Just checking, just checking. Right, I'm coming out here to you, into the lives of the audience. I'm coming right back up here into the corner. And um, so, problem solved. Have you got any problems that you would like to pitch to our esteemed panel? <laughs> How 
Why do you target your target segments for market research? Let's put it that way for you again. And, and trying to encourage that. So probably your reach isn't targeted enough, is that right? Uh, I don't think the reach is not big enough. Yeah. This is where I'm trying to always increase the reach. I think S Club 7 said the best one. You said reach for the stars. <laughs> Who would like to tackle it? I can try. I think, it's, uh, um, I think maybe potentially the problem there is that it's very hard to define the target sector and actually the demand and sunrise should drive your target, not the other way around. Um, and at times being too narrow or too selective or too um, a pinpoint is actually detrimental, damaging to the potential success or understanding of where you might want to evolve to or where your customers are, where they are, what they want, what they need. Um, there were some great comments earlier from um, I think it was Catherine who did the social speak around uh, understanding where your clients are, um, understanding what they're doing, um, and almost understanding what they need. And it's, it's the opposite question at times, that sometimes maybe you need to go broad before you understand what that is, and then define that down and work with that segment to build towards a better solution. If that makes sense. So, um, I think you can kind of over-research sometimes. Um, we found the most successful way for us is to get stuff out there and if it goes down really badly it's kind of a good lesson because you're like, well, what went wrong and people will tell you and then you can fix it. Mm -hmm. um, you're also not going to have a big reach straight away if you're trying to start a new product or something like that. So you just got to get out there and then eventually hope that your reach extends and you, know, you can market it as lots of different ways of trying to do it. Identifying like that key core market and that feature that you want to attack first would be like massively like we spent four years attacking the same market of stand-up pilot order purely because I'm a stand-up pilot order and that's actually relatively easy for me to go and achieve. Like I know I'm going to pilot orders, I can go and speak to them, I can get to the events, like, I'm quite well connected within that network. Actually, as a user base, we're already in a niche market of water sports or paddle sports. Most of my users are kayakers. You know, and actually that's where, just because that's the size of the market, so now we've taken that and going, right, okay, we've got our whole market nailed, now we're just reapplying the same things to new markets and learning about new markets to then find. So if you try and find those new markets and you're a business which isn't digitally tuned, should we say, um, are there any tools out there which you think people should look at in the first instance? Where are the easy wins for finding that market? Mm. Should I sing a song about that? <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of online resources, I think something you have to pay for. Um, like done market research, for example, let's say that you are, I can't really think of a, a non digital example, if you take games, for example, and you're developing a game, you think, well, I'm going to target it to teenagers. And then, you go and look at some online research and go out to the average game for ages in like 31. So there are online, just a bit of preliminary research can show you actually maybe if you tweak one or two things, you could then be targeting other people. Mm -hmm. um, there's all sorts of tools out there. I, I think from an understanding perspective, there's a lot of good social listening tools and content listening tools to understand how people are engaging, what they're engaging with. But then there's also a point to suggest that customer analytics and uh, understanding Reactions are more valuable than what you think might happen. And those reactions are what you fine tune to, you optimize towards, um, and you adapt towards. A lot of good analytical tools are free today, from Google Analytics up to, uh, there's lots out there, you can repurpose them in many different ways for many different functions. And if you're always monitoring to success, then you can always build upon that su success and extrapolate forward. But if you're too broad and you're struggling in a, in a, a mountain of just noise and non understanding, you should be testing constantly. And finding your success points and using those to optimize. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with that point. Again, just using Shopify as our, as our angle, because that's what we know most about. We can have customers get a new store up online for $29 in about two days. You know, and they can see it and immediately, they can see what's going on, they can see who's looking at their website, they can see which products are doing well. And it's costing them literally two days of our time, $29. Um, and then they can react. We kind of get more 
frustrates when some clients come to us with a project state that's incredibly detailed, drop it on the table and go, right, we want to work with this. And inevitably, any project usually takes about three months, a bigger project. And what you thought you're going to need in the beginning compared to what you need in the end is, is so different. And that's just in the process of building it. So once you've launched it and you have the opportunity to, to measure, and that's where it's key, looking at analytics and adjusting accordingly, ideally on a platform it's very easy to flex either way, then you're in a good position. But you know, if you go down the route without having the ability to adapt and you know, flex different directions, you're in trouble. So just, just looking at the analytics that's available. But be prepared to pay for it. I mean, there's great free stuff, but $100 here, $100 there is going to give you an awful lot of information which is worth getting rather than just trying to do it yourself. No one there it is. <laughs> uh, so we touched on those pink squishy things again there uh, very, very briefly. Um, and today we spoke about remote working quite a lot. Team communication is super important, no matter what, whether you're remote or co-located. Now we all are probably aware of tools like Microsoft Teams and Slack for team communication, so the process is quite easy. But how do you encourage people to over-communicate, which is often what is said is needed in a remote situation? Mm. Um, so this, the thing about remote work and making remote work work is that you have to be remote first. Um, you can no longer have a codependent conversation, you can no longer host things in the physical world. You need to drive everything via the digital world. Because once people go remote, they're no longer in the environment and they won't have the context of what's going on, they won't understand the conversations that are going on around them. There's lots of ways to deploy better processes that enable that. So um, we, we deploy Agile, so we use Agile stand-ups daily, we have general touch-ins, we record all ourselves in different channels, we use Slack for some things, we use, and by integrating those, it gives us a constant chatter around a multitude of different angles, but none of that would work without the process. None of that would work without thinking remote first. So lots of, I guess the idea of making it work is that you have to tilt your entire uh, philosophy of work back towards it to realize the real benefits of doing it. Um, so you're always going to have people on a team that are less likely to put in the room and communicate than you have to put them. And I think for us, uh, it's a mixture of characteristic. You say you have to communicate, otherwise, you know, it's, it's not good enough. And you also say you can kind of sit with down and go, this is the way we want to do things, and, and if we can achieve X, Y, Z in a certain time frame, then let's go to the pub. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of two ways of doing it, and you obviously, I think that. When people know where they are, so if you have a really clear set of this is how we want to do things, they're not set in stone, you can change them. But if you start with a goal and say this is how we want to do things, then people are often much more comfortable and will come forward. If you kind of go, let's do something, people will have a load of questions. You need to kind of set up the standards first. Yeah, I think it's something we find tricky in our company, I think, and I'm sure I'm going to do as well. You know, trying to lead with processes, say this is where we want to do stuff, this is where we use Asana, we use Trello. And then I'm out here say extra of my employees goes, what do they do today? I'm like, well, look on the Asana. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like, so you can, you can take it so far, but you still need to have those sort of little prompts and stuff like you're saying, just, just please just do it the way we talked about. So I think it's like we, we do find it hard, I haven't found the perfect solution for it yet. And we're all kind of, we have some sort of approach that you all try to do it the same way until someone says it's a better way of doing it, and then we sit down and do it as a team to review it. The bit, as a sort of business leader, I don't think like to just do it their own way without communicating anyone. So going back to that open communication is key. And everyone has autonomy to do something a bit better, but just do it as a, as a unit, and finding tools for that is tricky. And also, we put our eggs in one basket, like we use Asana, I don't know who else uses Asana here, it's a project management tool. Everyone's like on board, and then every other client we've ever had always wants to do something else, and it's just like, oh, for goodness sake. Yeah. So, <laughs> the challenges that we will have, but yeah, if anyone's got a good idea, do tell me. Just to kind of reiterate, so we, as a team, as a spiritual team, we came to bring in other people as we need to. Since day one, we've been remote working. Uh, the original goal was to set up a company where we don't have to work three months of the year and then spend the other nine months on the beach. Um, <laughs> so everything we've done has been around process and
trying to find the process that works. So I think one thing that we find really important is actually having a regular anchor meeting and every project I've ever done, I think since we started this, this round, but other rounds as well, the first thing is like, right, I want an anchor meeting here, where it doesn't matter what happens during the week, we ring each other up and we chat. Um, we talk about anything, anything that's got any ideas, anyone's got any things that are going well, things that aren't going well, that gets brought up. Um, and then outside of that, having kind of yeah, regular check-ins, regular goals, we don't stick to them. Like, we play fast and loose. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> we have, we like go, okay, right, end of October, this needs to be out. How do we get there? Well, we'll do this by that day, this by that, and we'll, we'll try and stick to maintain that. But we're constantly checking in against that. Where, and that plays into kind of our real lives of going, yeah, we've got this has become, become a priority, or this support question query has come in, this is now a priority, so we can push that back. But it's constant communication. You know, yeah, okay, we're a bit relaxed about it, and I don't know, there's probably some people going, oh my god, how do you survive? <laughs> but I think when it's constant communication, that's fine. You know, that's what works for us, and we spend a lot of time developing a system that works. Well, my goal would be three months a year on the beach. Just <laughs> 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 I mean, that's that's amazing, we're not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it uh, So, coming back out to the audience, this time we'll come out to the back left table. So, problems solved in the context of digital transformation. Uh, we, we're looking a lot about how technology can solve um, remote working problems, how we can be more distributed and working in new ways. But can the panel think of any things in their business which they are not doing digitally, but they don't want to transform? I'm interested in the negative. What do you not want to digitally transform and why? Testing. I get to go paddle wood every day. I still don't think you can be a good face-to-face conversation. Um, so we allow remote working, but we do say to people that, especially if you have a more senior role, you need to be in the office at least three days, or at least two days, but ideally three days a week. Um, because no matter, I mean, even if you were to put on a VR goggles and you might have a load of gloves and even have like an interactive space to go like, as yet, you still can't be genuinely in the same room with someone. Um, so I think that's the one thing that I really want to replace entirely. Um, uh, yeah, the other thing actually, we survive on micro payments, which are digital, we require people to buy through digital stores. We have a pretty much like digital entire marketing and everything. But I absolutely love going to events and just going to speak face to face to our customers or people who aren't our customers and just seeing what their thoughts are on how, how, how sports that is for us, are changing what people's trends are, and it's just seeing kind of genuine reaction. I don't think you can be that kind of you know, however digital your business is, you've got to have some sort of customer facing that is in the physical space rather than just online or over WhatsApp business, which while well, might be great, you can't ever gauge a real reaction or true emotion. Okay. Right, I'm going to go about so I'll try a different one there. Um, process. That sounds a bit advantageous and a bit out there, um, but process isn't digital, and a lot you can do better in process before it comes digital. And what I mean is that you can optimise the hell out of something before you even put a system in. And if you're not doing that as a business, you're risking uh, inefficiencies, bleeds, slack of change, um, maybe uh, fee firm and ownership over certain areas in your business, or um, not having that communication around how things work, or if you can actually make your processes your physical processes visual, and then have an ability then to optimise those processes, then plugging in digital is a no-brainer, because you really heavily drive that. And I don't think process is digital at all today, and I think that's still physical action. And, and I would like to, I guess, transform more of that as a business, but still understanding that still that happens in the physical world, and that's very important, and then we should continue optimising in the physical world, not just bring technology out of the problem. We do a series of regular meetups once uh, well, every quarter um, on the back of the Shopify platform, and we get a group of about 75 people together in a, in, a, in a space to talk about problems, ideas, the future of where sort of e commerce is going and stuff. And we tend to do it in like locations like our merchant stores, etc. Et it's just one of those great moments where we could be doing it 
over the over the internet broadcast it, but interaction with people, a little bit of networking, face of the company, and just people having those conversations that they wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable having private, you know, one to one. So that's something that we, we enjoy doing a lot of. And I think, as you said, face to face meetings is like absolutely key. I can never imagine doing staff reviews like <laughs> that might be a bad vibe. <laughs> yeah, so a few things like that. Yeah. The grumpy face emoji you're fired. <laughs> so you are trying to try and digitally transform the public world work. That's it. Trying to transform the agricultural work. Try and transform everybody's businesses. <laughs> Try and help other businesses transform. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there any common pitfalls that you've seen happen over and over and over again to the point where you can't believe that it's just common knowledge not to fall into those pitfalls? I'm guessing people lost down this thing. Yeah, yeah. 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 first. That's absolutely, I mean, and this is good that for all my years we've been just something to see. Focusing on the overcomplications, the, the, the five percent of the business model that they think is so important they can't do without, which sometimes is the case, but very rarely is. And putting so much energy into one little feature that really no one else is going to care about. And um, we see that happen a lot, but we're much better now at kicking back and going, no, no, just don't focus on that bit. Understand that the, the platform we're going to recommend. There is a trade-off. It's not going to be perfect for you, but you're going to be getting so much more than if you focus on that one bit that you think is important. So for us, it's, yeah, it's about removing the, the minutiae, not having complicated it, and understanding that trade-off can usually be very beneficial. Ooh, big questions. Um, uh, the one thing that I see commonality is um, inflexibility in your business model, um, especially from a transformational point of view. And if you, you are not able to change your business model, adapt it, and flex around it, again, you might lose out on the advantage what digital can bring from competitive lens to um, changes the way you might distribute or how you make way your value stream work in different ways or so having flexibility and I see that quite commonly that people aren't able to adapt quick enough in the business model then to capitalise on some of the basics of what's going on and the other one I suggest is data people forget about data constantly we talk a lot about digital and the front end and the experience of digital the importance of making all those functions work is in the back end is in how you run your data your infrastructure and actually, if you're very flexible in your data models, you can take quick advantage of all digital advantages. You can start working towards AI tomorrow if you're flexible in your backend, and you can kind of skip some of those problems that other companies might have in terms of their own digital maturity and going on those stages of that journey. You can tend to catapult because if you're flexible in the basic models, you can do a lot more quicker than others can. Um, so, from my perspective, I think I've seen so many times that people are convinced of things for no good reason. So for a business point of view, you could be I've seen people convinced of this business idea that no one wants. Um, and they will drive it into the ground because they're just convinced it's a good idea even though no one's buying it. And that's a big thing that when you start a business account and let go of that and just say, you know what, if no one wants it, don't make it, make the thing that people want. And from the customer side of trying to sell your service or trying to get someone to buy your service, it's exactly the same thing. In agriculture we come across people who are always proud of the fact that they can't use a computer. Those are not the people we should be selling to. <laughs> going to the guy who likes computers, you know? So, it just, yeah, that's, that's the main thing I've come across. So this is quite, quite interesting, I think. Um, working within a kind of digital space with also sort of water sports, um, there are less than 10 companies that I can think of off the top of my head that we would say we could have like, direct competition with, I suppose. Um, some of them are okay. We're, I'd like to think we're probably the best at what we do. Um, and when we started, we were the first people to do what we do. And I think looking across the sector, and then I think this is probably kind of generally applicable to business and being an ideas and innovation and being inspired from other sectors. I can't remember to say this. Essentially what we do is kind of like Strava or Matt Hammer or Matt My Life or sports, right? That's a nuts and bolts, it's very, very simple. Um, oh, sorry, I really had said that, but um, actually there are a lot more complexities to that, but we've actually got to take, take those 
broad ideas of quantitative self, strip them all the way down, and almost rebuild them for our market. Just because it works for that sector running, doesn't necessarily mean that the exact same thing, carbon copy, is going to work for another sport, which to all intents and purposes is exactly the same thing, moving across space from A to B. Um, and I think that's probably again, that's the same with the kind of sectors that we go, okay, learn from someone else, but then go out and understand your own market and go and really go, okay, this is why this works. And I think that's something that I'm very, very, very proud of the fact that we've taken the time to go out and do that and ask our customers and go, right, we know where you guys don't use that. So let's make something that you will use that will do a similar thing, but for you. Uh, Did it confuse anyone that was coming the other way? And so, before I pose my closing question, because we've run out of time here, is there any from the audience that you'd like to give us? No? Can anyone suggest a, a CRM that, um, for a small range of it's very configurable and adjustable? Um, uh, so I think from a free version and the configurability and integration-wise, HubSpot is really where you should start. Um, it's very integratable, it's very configurable, and it's free to get started. So you can test it and you can start to build your models. It does become very expensive as you add on the modules like marketing and uh, content production and other features. And that's where the model is, but it's something you can test very quickly, configure very quickly, and stress test your hypothesis of what you want to use it. If your technology reminded there's some good open source stuff you can install on your own servers, but you have to spend a lot more time and effort and you know how to do that. But I'll, we'll use HubSpot in time. We, we don't use it ourselves, but for our clients, and then we're using Clavio quite a bit, which is a little bit of an e e email marketing angle on it. But yeah, it's Clavio, it's um, you pay per volume of, of uh, subscribers, and if you're looking to email, and personalise and target and stuff like that, it's really good for that, but it's not maybe your classic sort of CRM system. Okay, and final thoughts in the scope of problem solving. And um, if we asked Flo, and he's gone to using it as an example, and he would tell me, he said, every problem your business has probably be solved by a bot of some sort. <laughs> <laughs> so for him, the next trend really is in digital assistance. That's the next digital transformation trend, digital assistance. Have you got any predictions as to what's going to be the next big thing in digital transformation of the businesses? And what's your big lot of I can't wait to get my hands on a pair. I think next year they're coming and that's AR glasses. Um, as soon as I can have every bit of my digital life floating from my eyes, walking on the floor, interacting with it. And you think about surgeons that are already trying to help, people are trying to fix stuff that don't necessarily need to have a question. I think that, I think eventually, big prediction, I think that we're eventually completely replacing the world. Yeah. Um, we're starting to make some of our own um, plays towards how we want to enter the market as a business, and being the incubator going to accelerate a startup. We're still in that kind of embryonic stage and looking at future curves. And there's a big trend that we understood in terms of development around back end development, front end development, as no code and low code platforms. I think there's a big play in these areas of allowing any business to be able to take on a platform, build their own applications, build their own prototypes, stress test data models. Um, it gives the power for anyone in any organisation to be an IT person without any understanding of how it works. I think that's a phenomenal advantage for smaller businesses and the ability to start them. Yeah, I think um, when we follow up with bots, it's on automation and AR, AR, AR is key. It was one of the areas that Shopify just released new APIs for, for example, language translations, so you can do the same one language and point the API that comes out in French. And they're also investing very heavily in the augmented reality sector, so, you know, spinning objects around in your, in your sitting room table and chairs you'll get from IKEA and I think in the next two or three years that's just going to become absolutely standard and advanced. So it's really um, kind, of, kind of what I'm saying, I think that the wearable stuff and that's got to keep going. We just built something which is quite exciting is smart paddles, so internet things and maybe stuff, equipment, sporting equipment thing that is minimal friction from a user, it just works, you just go out and do what you do and it does 
whatever it needs to do without any interaction from, from myself as a sports person or user. I was hoping you were going to say bigger paddles. <laughs> <laughs> I did see it on a circle recently about pollution monitoring for bikes in the Alright, that is the end of our panel. Can we have a huge round of applause for David Paul?